Hey, good morning to everybody. So we're going to start the second day of the conference. And uh, for me, it's a real pleasure to introduce you, Professor Carl Johan Armstrong from the Lund University. We all know very well his contributions to the control engineering field and especially to the process control field. Uh, as we saw yesterday, uh, uh, he has uh, not only a very impressive uh, uh, CV on research and academy, but also in with industry, uh, to, with transfers, uh, transfers technology to industry, which is very, very, very important um, for us. But I would like to remark uh, something about Carr and his, his uh, personality, his proximity, and his energy, because because we could think that uh, Carr is retired, but not anymore. Uh, Carr is again working at the university. He's now senior professor, and he's teaching again, and he has uh, new PhD students. <laughs> so Carr is a real pleasure to, to have you here. So please. Thank you very much, Jose Luis and, and Manolo. Uh, it's, it was a real pleasure for me to be invited here to give this lecture about PID control, because I had to put together a lot of materials that I haven't looked at for quite a while. So I will talk about PID control. And um, it's a long story. For me, it started around 1971 and 1980 when I took a leave from the university and worked for a very small company that was putting systems together. They were buying components from England, temperature controllers and things like this. And in connection with this, I met uh, a very nice man called Mike Somerville, who started the company Eurotherm. And Eurotherm was one of the earliest companies to do high quality, uh, continuous analog controllers. And they taught me a lot about how to do this. Then it also appeared to me that um, there was a big need for automatic tuning. And I was fortunate to have a very smart student in the department, Tore Heglund, who we'll hear in a little while. And um, we came up with the idea to do relay auto tuning, that I will tell you about. Uh, to uh, have a push a little button to tune the controller automatically. And also, we, we, we got a patent for that. And I told you a little bit yesterday about the story about the patent, so I won't re repeat this. And uh, we were also involved in the commercial exploitation of this. So we contacted a small company in Stockholm who was doing controllers, and they had a very good manager, uh, Sune Larsson. And it resulted in that they started up a small development activity in the science park in Lund. It took a while to get there, so they did another system. And the first system they made was uh, something called STM20. It's a small distributed control system. And that was the first implementation of the relay auto tuner. And then there was a whole sequence. The companies were, were changed and bought, etc. And um, we had a nice contract with them that... Um, uh, also included that they should sell licenses. And they were not very keen on selling licenses, you know, a small company like this. But I had the fortune of being a visiting professor at the University of Texas uh, in, in uh, 89 and 90. And that's the home of Fisher Controls. So I, uh, and Fisher had their own auto-tuning controller, which didn't work. So uh, they picked up our auto tuner, and as a result of this, I also became a member of their research advisory board. And I also became a member of the board of directors of Fisher Control. And we went through a very exciting period when um, uh, Emerson bought Fisher Control. You know, Fisher Control were best in the world with valves, they had crummy systems. There was another company called Rosemont who had the best sensors in the world and crummy systems. And uh, Emerson bought first Rosemont and then later on he bought uh, Fisher Control. And I was involved in the, in the process on the board of Fisher when this sort of thing happened. Very interesting experience. You know, we had Honeywell who had about 20% of the market and Fisher had about six. So you need to do market change. And of course, we, when, with, uh, with the new Fisher system, it was quite successful. And uh, there was also another interesting thing. I, the, I think the first controller we made say, well, we can put this in if you can squeeze it into two kilobytes. Tour and I were really cutting corners with this. So uh, 
As a result of this, we started research at the university to understand PID control and its use, to figure out what models are required, what you need to do to design cont PID controllers, and um, uh, how should we find computing rules. So this lecture, I will try to summarize whatever we have learned in about t 40 years of research. Something funny. Ah, this is too slow. I think I do it like this. I do it manually instead. No? Ah. Jose Luis, do you think what's, uh, what's wrong? Am I pushing the wrong? Ah. So I've had 40 years of collaboration with Tore Hegland. And uh, he was a PhD student 40 years ago. And uh, he wrote a PhD in adaptive control, which was a big research area at the time. And of course, the really auto tuner was a very different idea compared to the adaptive control we were doing. And then Turi was hired by the company who developed the controllers. And he worked for them for about five years. And then fortunately for us, he came back to the university. So then you got a person who had, you know, uh, PhD and then five years of industrial experience coming back to the department, which is very, very valuable. And Tour and I have written three books. Uh, this was the first one we wrote, the thin one. This was the second one, and this is the third one that we have written. So we wanted to document everything we knew about PID control to get it out there so it can be used in teaching, because we knew that there were many things about PID control that uh, were not really taught. Uh, we have also had a number of students, and for the last five years, uh, these are some of the students who have been uh, contributing to PID. So you see, it's still quite an active research area. Uh, and um, uh, why do we use uh, PID control so much? Well, here's what I call the magic of feedback. With feedback, you can make good system from bad components. You can make system insensitive to variations and disturbances in comp uh, to disturbances and component variation. We can stabilize an unstable system. And we cre can create desired behavior. Fantastic things you can do with feedback. The only two drawbacks. Number one, you can always create instability when you have feedback. And also, you are feeding sensor noise into the system. So you have to make sure you're not feeding too much sensor noise into the system, which we'll talk a lot about. And PID is the simplest way to enjoy this magic. So PID is the simplest way to enjoy all the benefits of feedback. There's something, something strange. Uh, and one, one uh, important contribution of the PID controller is the integral action. And a controller with integral action has some amazing properties. It doesn't matter if the process is nonlinear or how it's behaved, but as long as you settle to a steady state, the steady state error will always be zero. Uh, some people even call this that it adapts to disturbances. So the integral action, which has been discovered and rediscovered and discovered many, many things, it has the amazing property that if you have integral action, you will always reach the steady state if a steady state exists, and it doesn't matter if the process is nonlinear. That's something funny with this. So then, about predictions about PID control. Uh, I had a, a group of students of mine started to work with ABB to commercialize adaptive controllers. In 1982, they said like this, that uh, PID control will soon be obsolete. Why bother with PID control when you can have an adaptive controller? Uh, a conference in 1989 on model predictive control. Uh, they said um, that using a PI controller is like driving a car looking at the rear view mirror. It will soon be replaced by mo model predictive control. You know, that's a long time ago. Then we look at reality. In 2002, a gang from Honeywell, they investigated 11,000 controllers. 
and they found that 98% of them were PID. And 2% were advanced control, MPC and other things. Uh, and uh, they also said that PID controllers will always be used, because even if you use an advanced controller, you have a lower regulatory layer. The, the advanced controllers are not adjusting the values directly. They are adjusting set points of PID controllers. So the performance of the system depends very much on how these uh, PID controllers work. And also recently, in 2016, a Chinese investigation, they looked at 100 boiler turbine units in China. And they found that 94.4 were PI, 3.7 were PID. So if you take PI and PID, put them together, you get, a ra again, 98%. Uh, and then 1.2%, they were advanced controllers. Then we can look to academia. Pardon? This one here. Okay. Oh, works much better. Uh, also, the, the, what about the experience? Well, here is a summary of, did I? Yeah. Here's a summary of how controllers behave. Uh, and and um, not all controllers behave well. You know, 30%, the numbers vary a little bit. So more than 30% of installed controllers uh, operate in manual mode. So they're not even doing control actions. More than 30%, they increase short-term variability, etc. cetera. So uh, that indicates clearly the need for tuning. Now, what about the PID and the more advanced controllers? Well, the PI controller does not predict at all. An advanced controller predicts by using a mathematical model. A PID controller, it predicts by, ah, uh, it predicts by uh, extrapolation. You see, this is not right now. Then you use linear extrapolation of the output a little bit forward, and that's the signal you're actually controlling on. So a PID controller predicts by linear extrapolation. And here's now the academic view. Uh, I went to Scopus and looked for papers that had control in title, abstract, and keywords. And this is the blue line. So this is how control developed. And the logarithmic scales everywhere. Notice in here, this was when uh, control was founded uh, during the war. And then after there was a steady increase. And here we have what I call the golden age, from 60 to 70, a dramatic increase due to two things, the space race and putting computers to use them for control. And then again, we reached the steady level after around 1970 in here. And in here I plotted uh, the papers with, which mentioned PID. That's the red curve. And the green curve is the, pa the papers that are mentioning MPC. So MPC and PID are rising at about the same rate, and also the growth rate here is more rapid than the growth rate of papers on control, which is interesting. So around in here, around 1970, there was an interest in PID control, and there was also an interest at the same time in MPC. So now we come to what I'll talk about. I'll talk about requirements, I'll talk about trade-offs, I'll talk about PI control, I'll talk about PID control, and then I'll talk about the relay auto tuners. So here's what the PID controller looks like. Um, here's the process. And the process has two types of disturbances. Something I call load disturbance here, which is driving the process away from where you would like it to be. You know, if you drive a car, it's the slope of the car. In the process, it's you know, variations in compositions and temperature and things like this. Then you have another type of disturbance in here, N. And that's measurement noise. And that confuses the information you get about the process variables when you're measuring. So this is essentially the measurement error. And I put in here the disturbance up front, I put the measurement errors in the back. They can come in in, in several different ways. And then you have a feedback loop with a C, and then I have a feed forward from the command signal uh, 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 box. So the controller really has two boxes here, the, the F and the C. And this is called, um, uh, and the nice thing about this configuration, which Horowitz, a great Israeli control researcher, he said, this is a system with two degrees of freedom. You can change the feedback, and you can change the feed forward. And what's nice about it is that you design the feedback to be insensitive to low disturbances, Do not, you're not feeding in so much measurement noise, and, and you're not sensitive to variations in the process. And then you design the feed forward to get the right set point response. 
you get a separation of design for two degrees of freedom. And even PID controllers have this. Uh, they, we call it set point weighting, and it's called IPD. So you let the integral act on the error, but proportional and derivative part only acts on the measured signal. Uh, there is another thing about the controller that you also need to filter the measurement. I said, avoid feeding too much measurement signals into the process. You have to put in a filter. And a nice thing is that if you put in a filter here and you implement it as a second order filter, you can get out the filtered signal and the filtered derivative from the same device. And if you're doing dedicated system, you can actually do this in connection with the anti-aliasing filter. So you do the anti-aliasing, and then you're actually getting filtered, filtered outputs and filtered measurements. So this is quite a useful thing to use. And then we also have the integral wind-up protection, which is sitting in here. So you're measuring the, the difference between the output you compute and the actual output that goes into the process. And you take the difference, and this is feed it back. So here are the three parameters for the, the controller parameters. Then you have a filter coefficient, and then you have here a coefficient for, to avoid um, wind-up. <coughs> now, what about design? Well, here is one of my heroes, Greg Shinsky. He's a great control engineer who worked for Foxborough. He's written you know, many, many books, and he really understands process control. And he said like this, you should tune for load disturbances because most controllers are going to handle load disturbances, and they should not look so much at set-point response. Now, if you look to all control books, you look at set-point response. And Shinsky said, that's not what you're going to do. So we followed his device, and here I repeated again the controller, and I, I introduced here what we call set-point weighting. You, you put a, 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 a coefficient in front of the reference here for the uh, proportional term, and for the derivative term. For the integral term, you always have to integrate the error. And uh, this coefficient can be set to zero, and then it's what's called an IPD controller. So the controller here has six parameters, the ones we have shown here, and then we have the, the, uh, 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 this, uh, this signal for the, uh, the anti-windup. Now what about reaction to disturbances? Well, a very obvious thing is that how does the closed loop behave in comparison with the open loop? So, and that can be expressed by a transfer function called the sensitivity function, which is 1 over 1 plus PC. So what you would like to do is that you would like to have this, let this number be small. Well, if we plot here the Nyquist curve of a loop transfer function, you see that it always looks like this. Here's the critical point. So for frequencies below the sensitivity crossover frequency, you are actually reducing the disturbance compared to open loop. And in here, you're amplifying them. And the largest amplification is when you're close to the critical point, and that's what's called maximum sensitivity. So that tells you what's the maximum amplification you can get from the disturbances. So they are very nice to use for, for requirements in the control system. Um, we can look a little bit closer. So we can look at the transfer function from load disturbances to output. And I'm assuming that the load disturbances are coming into the process output, so it's this transfer function. Then we can approximate. The sensitivity uh, function can be approximated by this. And then we have the process transfer function. And here I drawn in blue the true transfer function. And here I've drawn the red one is this approximation. See, the red approximation is pretty good. So here I'm missing something. And the distance here is actually the maximum sensitivity. So around, you know, the crossover frequency. You, but this is a pretty good approximation. You can do an even cruder approximation. Here it looks like a straight line. And that's S over Ki. So for low frequencies, the, uh, the sensitivity depends on uh, the, uh, the derivative and then divide by Ki. So Ki is a sort of a measure of low frequency uh, uh, disturbances. Uh, there are many criteria. Uh, you can use integrated error. This is something that's very popular in the process control arena. You put in a load disturbance and then you measure the, the integrate of, of the absolute error. I will also talk a little bit about models. And this is quite a popular model in the PID control area that we'll talk a lot about. It has uh, a time delay, 
It has a time constant. And there's one parameter that's very important. We call it the relative time delay. The actual time delay divided by the sum of the time delay and the time constant. So this number is all between 0 and 1. And we call the system lag dominant if tau is small. This means that this is the important term. And we call it delay dominant if tau is close to 1. And these are very important concepts that has dawned upon Tour and me that we should pay attention to. There will be more about them as we go along. Uh, what about measurement noise? Well, then we assume that the measurement noise is coming in here, and we calculate what's the effect of the measurement noise. Well, it's going to influence the process output, but it's also going to influence the control signal. And the worst thing is the effect on the control signal. You know, the valves start to move up and down. And you want to guarantee that the measurement noise here will not create too much disturbance in here. So we figure out what's the transfer function from N to U. And uh, if this is the, the filter transfer function, this is the controller transfer function. The transfer function from N to U, there's a minus sign in here, it's C over 1 plus PC. And again here we can approximate. We can approximate the sensitivity function as we did before. And here in we just have the controller. So the same way as we had approximations before, the blue one is the actual curve here. And the red one is the approximation that I gave. And the approximation is pretty good. And the difference is, again, again, the maximum sensitivity. And then you notice in here that if you have delay-dominated processes, the maximum disturbance gain is one happens at low frequencies. So in here, for lag-dominated process, measurement noise is not very important. Here I have PI, and here I have PID. If you look at balanced processes, if you still are using uh, PI, you see, measurement noise, not very important here. But if you use PID control, derivative action, then you see in here, you get a high peak. So if you're using uh, with, with uh, bal balanced dynamics, you know, tau is around one, then you see, for PID control, you have to worry about measurement noise. And now you go down to lag-dominated processes, and then you see, both for PI and PID control, you have high peaks of the noise. So this is where you really have to be concerned about measurement noise. It also shows why lag dominant and delay dominant. It's important to classify processes in these uh, categories. Um, you can stochastic modeling, and you can go through a little bit of mathematics, and you can come up with, with two criteria. One is what I call the noise gain. And that's the following. You have the controller with a noise filter on, and then you compare the standard deviation of the controller output with the standard deviation of the filtered measured signal. And the nice thing about this is that it's expressed only in terms of controller parameters, and here's a steady state gain of the controller. For a process with, with, uh, with integral action, of course, this is infinite, so this one disappears. Uh, you can also introduce something called SDU, which is the standard deviation of the output itself. Uh, it, and, of course, that depends on the noise characteristic, so it's a messy one. But in the same way as you have EAE, when you have a unit step input, in here we say, well, I normalize the noise disturbance, and then I get another quantity, which is similar to this one, which is SDU. You see, in here, there's a difference with the square root of the filtered time. The only one, this one here, so you multiply this one with square root of filter. So both of these are used to characterize the, the, um, uh, the effect of noise. So now we can look at trade-offs. And first we look at um, low disturbance and r attenuation and robustness. So here is a curve where, for a specific design, the blue lines are the level curves for the integrated absolute error. And the red curves are the maximum sensitivity. And you can notice a few things. In here, the curves are almost parallel. So you see that Ki is roughly performance. So you set performance by the integral gain, and then you adjust Kp to get uh, the... Uh, uh, you, you would like to get as high up here as possible, but you, you don't want... you wouldn't like to have a certain sensitivity. So here's where you would like to go. So then, you know, somewhere here along these lines is uh, uh, where you would like to be. Uh, what about uh, measurement noise and uh, uh, load disturbance attenuation? 
Well, here I've shown a design where you have a PID controller, and then you change the filtering time constant. So here I show the noise gain, and here I show the integrated error. So in here you see that you would like to have a low integrated error, so you would like to be in here. But then you see, if you don't do any filtering, you have a very high noise gain. And here you can filter quite a lot, uh, and you, you're not increasing so much. So in here you have to do a compromise. And if you filter a lot, suddenly the controller becomes a PI controller. And you know, if you have PID and filter a lot, it becomes a PI controller. So clearly, uh, it, it's helpful to uh, admit that if you can admit the noise gain of about 10, you are pretty well off. But if you have very high noise, uh, you may be forced to get a noise gain of about 1, and then you see you might just as well use a PI controller. Uh, so what about PI control? Uh, we uh, we're following the same procedure as Siegler and Nichols. You know, we're test batch. You run through controllers, and uh, then we design uh, uh, controllers for them, and we compare them. And we had the heritage both from uh, from uh, Eurotherm, and we have about 123 processes. And here you see the the step responses normalized, and we we are looking at processes with essentially monotone step responses. You see, you allow yourself to go a little bit below here, but essentially the step responses look like this. Uh, and then for the optimization, we can use convex optimization. So if you would like to be outside this line for each frequency, you say they are going to be above this line instead. I'm going to skip this slide. Here are the results for PI, for PI control. If you go through the exercise, and you, then you plot the, uh, for example, the controller proportional gain and the integral time. And you see, it's a pretty good match for the whole test batch. So essentially, uh, and you can also see that uh, here is the Siegler-Nichols parameters. And clearly, you see that uh, they will certainly not work, because they will, uh, you will get a good value for this one for lag-dominated. And in here for, for delay dominated, you get a good value for TI here for the lag dominated ones. But clearly, two parameters is not enough. You need three parameters. So we can actually do a tuned PI control with an FOTD model with, with three parameters. Uh, and here are some tuning rules. Uh, it's uh, our rule sitting down here is Skogistad has been here, so that's Skogistad's rules. And um, if we go and look to the diagrams, you can plot uh, what the rules look like in the diagrams I showed you before. And you see that Skogestud has a little bit too high uh, proportional gain for all of them. Here is where you really would like to be. The, uh, the designs we have, they are lining up along this line in here. There's something called lambda tuning, which looks like this, which is not good. So these diagrams are good for comparing control laws. The same if you have, this was for lag dominated dynamics, this for balanced dynamics, then you see suddenly Skogestad's rules gives a little bit too low gain instead. And if you look at lag dominated dynamics, uh, you can understand here why Skogestad changed his first rule, this one, to that one, to get better performance. So this is a good way to represent the results. Now, what about PID control? This is the Robustness region for PID control. So here, for a specific process. So here I plotted proportional gain, der derivative gain, and integral gain. And notice in here, you have a very sharp dip there. You would like to kick up integral and high, but if you do this, you are sitting there. So Tour and I are saying, you know, don't fall off the derivative cliff. So uh, it's difficult to tune up there. Now, uh, if you uh, do a typical example, you take a PI controller, and with the methods we have, we can easily deal with uh, funny transfer functions. And here we see that if I'm minimizing the integrated error, this is what I get. And if I'm minimizing, uh, if I instead use a PID controller, I get dramatically better performance. You see here are the, the uh, responses to step, uh, load, uh, load step restore. Look in here. The, the main difference between this one, which is the PID, and this, is that you are reacting faster. Uh, you're reacting faster, but uh, that's why you get better performance in here. And here you can see what the Nyquist curve looks like. And you also have to watch out when you're doing optimization. Because 
when you optimize, you write down a criterion, and then you, you, you change parameters until you optimize the criterion. So you have to be very careful what criterion you choose. And this shows that, that integrated error may not be so good. So this is a third order system. And then uh, this is the Nyquist curve when I'm minimizing the integrated error. And you see it has a cusp on it like this. And you can see here, this is the blue curve. And the peak is small, but it's oscillating. And since you're doing integrated error, here you, you, you get penalized, and here you get benefits because you have negative error. So integrated error here um, gives this sort of funny effect. You have a low peak, but instead it's oscillatory. So instead if you move to um, integrated absolute error, that's a green curve. Uh, and you see what happened is that you have lower integrated error but you have a higher peak sitting in here. And then you can also say, well, I'm going to do this one here, but I'm going to introduce a, a convexity constraint. So the cur I'm not going to allow this one. So you introduce a curved constraint, and then you're going to get the red curve, which is a compromise in between. So whenever one is using optimization, one should always be aware of the fact that you, you get what you optimize. And if you're not careful with criteria and constraint, you may get bad results. So now do PID control. So you run through the test batch, and then this is what you get. Um, so again, here, here is the relative time delay, and here is the proportional gain. And you see, you're doing very well in here. But when the relative time delay gets small, in here there's chaos, which means that if you're using this FOTD model, the three-parameter models, in here, this is not good enough. Incidentally, this is the lower curve for this process, and this is for the upper process. So in here, uh, you need to do better model. So if you're going to do PID control, it's no problem at all to do it up here, when processes are, are uh, delay-dominated and balanced. But if you're getting down to lag-dominated processes in here, uh, it's not good enough to use a FOTD model. And that's also something you can show in this diagram, which shows the gain of a, the integral gain of a PI controller divided by the integral gain of the PID controller. First of all, see if you are lag dominated here, there's really no difference between them. If you go down to a relative time delay of about 0.4, then you see you get a factor, you gain a factor of two by derivative action. And I think that's one reason why there are so many PI controllers out there. If the processes are uh, lag dominated or balanced, uh, derivat uh, derivative action doesn't give you much. But then when you move into this region, you see you can get orders of magnitude improvement if you are using... Uh, uh, but then, you know, it's very important to know if the process you have is this one or if some other process in here. So what you do is that you need better modeling. So if you have systems that are uh, lag-dominated, you need to do better modeling. Okay. So we learned something. And now we're going to look at really auto tuning. So this is the idea. Uh, you switch in a relay instead of the PID controller. And then what's happening, you develop an oscillation like this. So this is how the relay banks, and this is how the output banks. So essentially, if you approximate the output here by a sine wave, you see that you're exactly 180 degree out of phase. So you're essentially picking up this point on the Nyquist curve with this experiment. And if you have hysteresis in the relay, you pick up this point here instead. So this was how we started. And you can say that this is the Siegler-Nichols frequency response method. So you can say that what Tour and I did, we automated the Siegler-Nichols response method. You flip in this relay, you wait for steady state, which occurs pretty quick, and then in here I get information about one point on the Nyquist curve, and then we will use a modified Siegler-Nichols rules. So that's what we here, incidentally, is uh, a young Ture. And this is the first industrial experiment we did. Uh, this is uh, the sugar refinery near Lund. And the computer does the work was an Apple II computer, which had the, f the code of the first really altitude. Okay? It's actually that Anna wrote the code, incidentally. Uh, here's an experiment. Um, it was uh, when they were trying out this system, SDM20, up in the north of Sweden, you know. Normally when you commission a system, you're, it takes a couple of weeks to do it. In here, with the outer tuner, they did it in two days. You know, switch one loop, push a button, take another one, push a button. So people were radiant. So they came past and said, we have this process here we've never been able to control. Can you try your magic on that? 
So we connected it here. You can see what happens here. This is a, uh, the, the sort of recording. It's just, so time runs in this direction. So first we let it run, and you see you have an oscillation. No derivative action, very typical. Gain of, of 8 and 2,000 integral time. Uh, you switch to manual, and then you see you stop the oscillation, but it starts to drift. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we push the tuning button. Uh, so what's happening, here is actually a measurement of hysteresis, so there's some logic going on. In. And in here you see, this is what's the real oscillation. So you know, this is 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. I say, oh, are we going to give up or are we going to hang in there? At 8 o'clock, it's finished, so it goes automatic, and look what it does. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, what it does, it uh, reduces gain, introduces a heavy, heavy derivative action into it. So I think this is a nice example of what a really auto tuner can do. So then, you know, there's a lot of commercial things. Uh, the, uh, one of the ideas that you have, we have one button to push for tuning. In the earlier ones, we had three settings, fast, slow, and, and, and delay dominated. Uh, you generate a gain schedule automatically. Uh, so you can also use this idea to you know, generate gain schedules. And there are many versions. There are single loop controllers, there are DCS controllers, they are robust. And there's a very good industrial experience, and they are out there in large numbers. So here are the functions, automatic tuning, gain scheduling, adaptive feed, feed, forward, feed forward. So this uh, STM. And then, as the names changed, you know, alpha. And here we have the big guy, Emerson, in '99, and the ABB in 2004. So, so these are now uh, sort of standard features in both ABB and in Emerson systems. Uh, so now the question is, what should the next generation auto tuners look like? You know, Tour and I have successfully over this year learned much more about the PID control. So clearly. Uh, the uh, basic relay auto tuner can be improved. Also, you know, computations have improved tremendously. So, number one, a sine wave essentially only permits the termination of two parameters. The one point on the Nyquist curve. Uh, and we can uh, design PI controllers based on the FOTD model. There's little difference between PI and PID for process with delay dominated dynamics. And then derivative gives us an improvement of factor two when tau is greater than 0.45, and PID controls require better modeling. And, we sh uh, uh, and the reason for that is that you have to separate real-time delays from higher-order dynamics. So for a new auto-tuner, uh, we would like to have short experimentation time. We don't, we don't want to wait for steady state. Um, and so we would like to modify the relay experiments. We would like to try other types of inputs, and we've tried many things. I'll give you one example in here. One of the simplest ones is to use an asymmetric relay. You can also add other signals. And we would like to have a button that tells you robustness and performance trade-offs. So uh, these are the sort of models we currently be, we, we can use. We should estimate this model, that model, that model, or that model. And then we use system identification technique to sort out which model it is. And we had a student, Josephine Banner, who finished a PhD thesis just before Christmas, and she tried an asymmetric relay. You know, with symmetric relay, you essentially get a sinusoid. With as asymmetric, essentially, roughly speaking, two sinusoids, you know, short one and a long one. And here is the sort of input signal that she generates. Uh, you see in here, that's the asymmetric relay oscillation, and she also just, uh, just amplitudes. It's a fairly short experiment, and we are certainly not waiting for steady state. Uh, if you look to the spectrum of the signal, this is with a symmetric relay. Essentially, you know, one peak, and then you get the next harmonic sitting there. With the asymmetric relay, you get this peak and this peak, which are much better for control design. If you would really go into the, the lag-dominated system, then you should perhaps do even better excitation. So we've been doing experiments by using chip signals. You know, this type of thing is a sinusoid with um, increasing frequency. And we actually increase the amplitude a little bit to get the output, uh, uh, to get the constant of the output. So with this one, you can get uh, quite improved data. If we only use a relay, this would be a typical Boulder plot you get. But if I'm adding about an, a chirp experiment to it, uh, I'm really nailing down what the transfer function is, uh, both in the higher regions and in the lower regions. 
So my current thinking is that I think you should actually have a short relay experiment followed by a chirp, and, and then you do identification for this, and you get the models for it. So here's what I've done. I spoke a little bit about PI and PID control. I spoke about a little bit about relay auto tuners, and the story isn't finished yet. We haven't done, you know, the what I'm. We haven't done some, uh, like a product for the ones I'm talking about right now. So to summarize, uh, uh, we have got a lot of insight into PID control. And number one, PI control can be designed on FOTD models, and uh, we have f we know that it's very important to separate lag-dominated and delay-dominated. So for a system with essentially monotone step responses, the, uh, these are a crude classification of them. And if you are um, uh, delay-dominated, use a PI control. If you are a balanced dynamics, you know, you can benefit a factor of two by adding derivative action. But if you are, are lag-dominated, you can gain a lot by, by derivative action. But you need to have much better models of it. So uh, this has given us ideas how to do the next generation of auto-tuners. So they will use system identification and model testing, and we use algorithms instead of simple tuning rules. So we have given up on the simple tuning rules. You, know, you, you, you design a model, and then you, know, you, you essentially run design. And if you run design, you get two things. Number one, you don't have to approximate. And number two, you can have a tuning button. You can have a tuning button in the design. So this is something we're discussing, that, uh, but we have not done. So, uh, you know, it's a been a 40-year story, and it's not finished yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl, for the nice presentation. So, do you have any question? Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. I want to to talk about the um, the criteria when <laughs> when you optimize to to uh, tune the controllers. You talk about the importance of the different criteria, and these results depends on the, the criteria you choose. There is a definitive criteria. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is a, a, a preferred criteria for uh, what is your opinion about the different ways of uh, okay. evaluate. Okay. Uh, the question is, what are the different? Uh, the, the, maybe I wasn't clear that the criteria they should involve performance, and I think uh, integrated absolute error for a low disturbance is 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 not a bad criterion. There are other alternatives, and then you have to have robustness. And uh, to have the maximum sensitivity and the maximum complementary sensitivity, that is good. good. And then you have to have noise uh, injection. And there, I think, uh, the noise gain is not a bad criterion because it only involves controller parameters. But there might be other criteria that, that might be better because uh, it depends on what the user can provide you. If you ask a user, what would the noise gain be? And the noise gain is sort of funny because it's the ratio of the fluctuations of the output, standard deviation of the output, divided with the standard deviation of the filtered output. So uh, we are not sure what would ultimately be the best way to express the noise situation. We had a, a student a couple of years ago did a thesis devoted to that, but, uh, uh, and they've given us good insight, but I don't think it's the absolute definite answer. Uh, it also has a little bit to do with, with, you know, what sort of optimization routines are you doing. Thank you, Carl. I, I would like to know your opinion. Do you think that it makes sense to perform analysis like yours for uh, oscillatory systems, second order, and then tamper? I know that most systems are this kind, but... Back up a number of slides. Ah, there. Uh, you see, that's the reason. Uh, we, if I'm including a model like this, or like this, I'm capturing oscillations. And also, I'm capturing a, a, a zero in the right half plane. So by, by estimating, for example, these three models, 
and doing model testing of them. We can capture systems that are oscillatory, we can capture unstable systems, we can capture systems with zeros in the right type plane. And that's also why I think it's, it makes sense nowadays to move away from simple rules and to go away to use optimization instead. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah. <laughs> I thank you, Carl, for this uh, wonderful presentation. My question is very simple. Do you, is the, the sense of getting Turing rules? I mean, today we are uh, leaving that button, you get a very complex optimization out. So you can practically tune your controller by just pushing the button and you get parameters. Yeah. Okay? But uh, instead of this, you can get Turing rules for some, you know, class of uh, systems yeah. according. So, uh, what's your opinion about if uh, it should continue getting turning rules, or we should take out of the, you know, the power of the computing and, oh, okay. and start turning? But you know, I don't think that's a yes and no answer. Suppose that you are going to make a single loop controller and then you need turning rules. And, you know. Computers are developing right now. You can put in optimization routines, and then you can jump up to the cloud and do this. So, so my tour and I were spending a lot of time doing tuning rules, uh, but my current thinking is that uh, I would probably start to look for optimization and see if I can solve the optimization because it gives you so much extra flexibility. Uh, and then the question: is, Can you squeeze this into the device that you have or not? More question? Okay, so thanks very much, uh, Carl. And we have uh, a present for you from the uh, local oh. committee. And I would suggest you all stand up and shake your arms. You get blood circulating before a tourist starts talking.